It was just uh, looking this uh, last week and thinking about what I was going to minister on this morning, and and I think I want to minister this morning on suddenlies. Um, you know, I was looking at, <clears throat> I was thinking about the religious, the religious group in Jesus' day, and what was amazing to me was that as much as they studied the Word, as much as they <clears throat> studied the Scriptures, there's not a book you can't read that would have indicated to them that they were in error. Any book that they read would have indicated to them that they didn't have the truth. Because, you know, the, the Bible, the, the Old Testament consistently tells uh, people, or God's people, what would happen if they left him or if they got off in air. It constantly tells them that they would be a reproach, you know, a, a hissing and a byword to the nations. And when Jesus shows up on the scene, the, you know, the Roman Empire, think about the Roman Empire has now got control of God's people. Now think about the Roman Empire, that was a nasty empire. We're not talking about an empire that's close to God, we're talking about an empire that has all kinds of gods, that's in every kind of perversion that there is, and they have control of God's people. They're taxing God's people, they have the rule over God's people, and the religious crowd in Jesus' day should have been able to have studied the scriptures and said, we're in error. We are in big error because we are in such bondage that everything that the Old Testament says is going to happen to us if we leave God, if we, uh, are, if we uh, don't pay attention to God, if we don't love God, everything has happened to us that what we're reading has, ha has happened. It's come to pass. And so Jesus comes along and begins to expose that and immediately they begin to reject what he says. Now, something we learned, or something that, that came to me in Bible study the other night, and it's probably something most everybody knows, but it was just a little bit of a slant, a little bit of a different thing that I had never really thought of before. Even though I know what the word deception means, I know deception means that you think you're right when you're really wrong, but one of the things that I always thought about the devil was that he knew he was wrong, he just wanted to prove himself to God. And the thing that finally dawned on me was, the devil thinks he's right. He thinks he's more right than God is. And that's where the conflict comes in. And really, if you read what he says, I will ascend to the Most High, and I will do this, and I will do that, that obviously shows that he thinks he's right. But I always thought the devil, you know, deep in his heart thought, I'm really, I'm really wrong, it's just that I don't like God so much, that I'm going to fight against him. I'm going to fight my wrong against his right. And it's not that way. It's the devil thinks he's right. The devil thinks it's right for him to punish us for sin. He thinks that's more right than God's way. The devil, when he punishes us, when he, ex when he causes us to die, when he puts sickness on us, when he punishes us for the things that we do, he thinks that's more right than God's way of straightening us out. And so that's one of the reasons we have such a tough time speaking to religious people is because you're dealing with people that think they're right. They think they're more right than God is. Now, they're never going to say that but if you start reading and start quoting the scriptures to them and quoting the Bible to them, they'll either get angry, they'll look down in their lap, they'll start mocking, they'll start making accusation because they have nothing with which to stand on and you're shaking what they think is their rightness with the word of God. It's amazing to me how many times I read in scripture, <clears throat> I was reading yesterday about Jeroboam, he was the first king of Israel after the split. You know, you know when the split happened? After, after Solomon died. And Judah went with Rehoboam and, and the other 11 tribes went with Jeroboam. There's a lot of Boams in the Bible. And, you know, Jeroboam, 
He got a word from God, said, you're going to be king over Israel from a prophet. I want you to think about this. Got a word, said he was... Now, now, look, we're not talking about, you know, a word that says, I love you, I love you, my child, sing to me, sing to me, or, you know, you've had fiery darts thrown at you, and the Lord's going to quench those fires. We're talking about being a king of Israel now, Jack. We're talking about 11 tribes. You get a word from a... This is a real prophet. And you get a word, and he says, you're going to be the king over Israel. That's a real word, isn't it? And we're talking about this happened in his lifetime. You know how a lot of the words we get we're still waiting for and we'll probably die and they'll never happen? This happened in his lifetime. And so the prophet comes and, and, you know, Jeroboam decides to build an altar and, and make these false gods because he's worried about the people going back to Rehoboam. He says, if I don't keep the people here... If I don't make something for them to worship here, they're going to go to Jerusalem, and they're eventually going to go back to Rehoboam, and I'm going to lose the kingdom. So we have already see that he doesn't trust God because God said he was going to be king. And he's already losing trust in what God has told him. But he builds this altar, and this prophet comes and speaks over the altar and says, that, you know, a, a child by Hosea, Hosea will be his name. He'll, he'll sacrifice and burn bones on this, and, and he'll sacrifice the, the, high, the priests of the high places. And Jeroboam stretched out his hand and said, arrest that guy. And it says his hand withered, and he couldn't pull his hand back in. So what's he do? He, he says to the prophet, he says, pray, for, pray to the Lord your God for me that my hand might be restored. And so the prophet says, prays for him. His hand is restored. The, the altar splits. The ashes pour out. Now, wouldn't you think if that happened to you, you'd say, I need to follow this God. <laughs> but see, they don't because they think they're right. And he goes right on with his false gods and right on with his false worship and making priests out of every, out of every uh, class of people. He goes right on doing it. And there's stories like that all throughout the Bible where God comes down and proves himself, because, but people think, because we're so under the influence of the devil, we always think we're more right than God. And it's very, very, I mean, that's a scary place, folks. It's a scary place because you think you're right. So how do we get, how do we get, how does it reveal to us, how does it get revealed to us that we're not right? How does it get revealed to us that we think we're more right than God? Through, yeah, through, of course, through the Word, through the Bible, but it's also a desperation of wanting to be right with God. A desperation of wanting, of, of, uh, it's a, it's a, it has to do with a confession. God, we know we're doing things that we think are right, that aren't. You know, we should be able to read the Bible right now. Churches should be able to read the New Testament right now and read the type of people that we're supposed to be, and they should be able to say, we're in error. This is not happening. We are in error. But you know what the problem is? They think they're more right than God. Think, think about what the New, just the New Testament. Think about what type of people we're supposed to be. We're supposed to have gifts flowing. We're supposed to have salvation being uh, growing in our lives. And of course, what is, we know what salvation is. It's in this life, not in the next life. We should be being changed from glory to glory and him. I mean, there's just one scripture after another, after another, after another that tells us what type of people we should be. And we should be able to read that as church people and say, we're, we're wrong somewhere. I mean, we in this church should be able to read the Bible and say, this is not happening in our lives. We should be healthier, living longer. And just try to deal with somebody that thinks they're right, more right than God is. And you read the Bible to them, and they just, it goes right over their head. You could heal their withered arm, 
You can have the altar split open and have ashes come out, but they're still going to do what they think is right. I mean, just think about the children of Israel. Water from the rock, fire by day, or fire by night, a, a pillar of fire by night, a pillar of cloud by day, shoes don't wear out, and yet they still think they're more right than God is. And that's what you're dealing with. That's why we have such a difficult time ministering to people, especially religious people, is because you're dealing with people that think they're right. And, of course, you know, some, of course, you know, you know that if you ask them, they're all going to say, oh, no, we're not right. Oh, we know we're sinners. But they're not going to change one thing. They're not going to change one thing. They're just going to say with their mouth they're sinners. But the minute you try to change them with anything, you've got a battle on your hands. And so I, why did I say all of that? <clears throat> because you see, the Bible has got some suddenlies in it. Did you know that? It has some suddenlies. Turn with me to Malachi. Chapter 3. I'll get there eventually. <laughs> Verse 1, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he's coming, says the Lord of hosts. I could quote some other suddenlies we know in the, book, in the book of Acts. We've got a suddenly on the day of Pentecost, don't we? It says, suddenly there was the sound of a mighty rushing wind. Paul was on his way to Damascus. And it says, suddenly a light from heaven shown around him, or around them. We can go into Jeremiah, I think it's chapter 50 or 51, and it says, suddenly Babylon shall be broken. And it really, and it, that's just where it says suddenly. You know, there's a lot of suddenlies where it doesn't use the word suddenly. Suddenly, Sarah got pregnant. That had to be a suddenly. And I found that that's the way God works. But he's only going to work that way in people that are becoming more and more desperate to be right with God. Yeah. And that's something that I'm looking for in this church is a suddenly. You know, we've come to a place, and I think I can probably speak, I'm hoping that I'm speaking to most everybody here, is that there's a dissatisfaction that lives inside of you as to where we're at right now. There's, a, there's like a dissatisfaction, like a, you're carrying around, and, it's, and it, you, don't, you really can't put your finger on it. Yeah, there's a dissatisfaction on where you are personally with God, but there's also a dissatisfaction where the church is. There's a dissatisfaction that you see what's going on in the world around you, in the church world around you, and, there's, and you don't know what to do about it. And so it can also be, it can, it can be kind of a, I don't know how to describe it, a frustrating, anger, yeah, gnawing, nagging, you know, almost like sometimes you just want to run away and leave that feeling. You wish you could take it out of your heart and set it on the shelf and go somewhere and get a rest once in a while. Wouldn't that be handy? Well, it really wouldn't. Because if you could get a rest from it, you're going to eliminate your suddenly. And that's one of the problems that, that we run into, uh, uh, many times that, that we run into as the church, is that we start to try to make God's word work, and when we do that, we eliminate the suddenly. When we start doing things, when we, when we start doing things, because we see these things that are wrong, and because we know that our walk is wrong, and so we start doing things that God necessarily doesn't tell us to do, although they may be a good idea, you've just cut off your suddenly. 
You know, it's always been my belief, I don't have a scripture to prove this, but it's always been my belief that as Paul was on his way, when he saw Stephen being stoned and, and, and looking up into heaven and saying, you know, God forgive them, or I, don't, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the, you know, do not lay this sin to their charge or something like that. I think that really shook Paul to his core. And I think that made Paul very desperate. I think Paul, you know, was going around. Of course, we obviously know that he thought he was right by persecuting Christians. And, and he went to the high priest to get letters. And anywhere he found anybody in the way, he could bring them to Jerusalem bound. He could bring them to prison. And when he saw that happen, I believe that created such a conflict in him that that's what caused the suddenly on the road to Damascus. That's what caused the suddenly. It's, and like I said, I don't have any proof of that, that Paul actually thought that, but I have some indirect proof of the Bible, because the Bible says, if you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. I will be found by those who seek me. If Paul wasn't seeking for him, and, and he got found, then God's a liar. Yep. And we should all live case sera sera and wait for our experience on the road to Damascus, while we're going about doing evil things. I think it shook him to his core and it caused him to, to, to cry out and make such a, a, a hunger and a thirst that he wanted to know, God, am I doing right? I think I'm doing right, but God, I just saw something that I can't explain. I just saw somebody forgive and say, lay not this charge to their sin. And he's thinking, I wouldn't do that. And it opened the door to a suddenly for Paul. They're waiting up there in the upper room. And we get the idea that, you know, I don't know what we get the idea. You know, they're up there maybe singing songs or discussing things. I believe that each day that goes by, they're becoming more and more desperate. The ones that are left. A lot of them left. You know what I mean? I mean, they left, the, there was 500 to start with, and I think there was 120 on the day of Pentecost, so 380 of them left. But I believe they started becoming more and more desperate. Now, had they left before that day and said, well, we're, you know, we can't just sit here and continue in this room in prayer. You know, we need to go out and do something. Things are happening. You know, the, the people, you know, if we wait much longer than this, these people are going to forget about Jesus and we're going to lose the edge that we have right now. Let's get out there and preach anyway. They'd have never had their suddenly. Now I'm not advocating sitting around waiting for a suddenly. Okay? I'm not advocating that we just come here and have our church services and just go, okay, you know, every time, have the same thing all the time until finally a suddenly appears. No, I believe that the catalyst for a suddenly is that people become more and more desperate. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. And the devil will use that desperation to try to get you to do something before you're suddenly. We just read here in Malachi, notice what it said. It said, it said the Lord in whom you're waiting for, or the Lord in whom you delight, See, there was a group of people that was waiting for Jesus. We don't hardly see that in Scripture because we looked at the religious crowd and because they rejected him, but there was another crowd that was desperately waiting for Jesus, and that's what brought on the suddenly. He appears in his temple. And so what God has to do is, that, and this is going to be tough on us, folks, it's going to be tough. Is God wants to raise up a people that will continue to get more and more desperate until he can bring a suddenly upon them. And suddenly he'll show up here. And suddenly whatever it is that we've been waiting for will appear. Because you notice every time there's a suddenly, a great change takes place. It wasn't just the sound of a mighty rushing wind. Those people got changed. Paul got changed. When Jesus showed up, people got changed. When Babylon falls, people get changed. And so I'm not advocating just sitting around waiting for a suddenly, and we just, there has to be, a, there has to be inside of us an urgency 
a desperation, a hunger, and a thirst that has to continually increase until a suddenly can come. You know, something that, did you, how many of you watched last night? And something that, one of the things that he was talking about, prophets, and he said one of the things about prophets is, is that things bother prophets that don't bother regular people. And you see, I, I know where he's coming from with that, but, and that may be true, but it's wrong. Because anybody who claims to be a Christian should be bothered by everything that a prophet is bothered by. It should bother every Christian of the unfaithfulness of church people. That should bother everybody, not just the prophet. It should bother everybody. If you've got the Holy... Do you think the Holy Spirit's bothered by that? Then if you've got the Holy Spirit, if you've got the Spirit of Christ, shouldn't you be bothered? So it should, I could see religious people not being bothered by that. Now that I understand. But anybody who claims to be a born-again, Spirit-filled Christian should be bothered. And when he said bothered, he said, you think it's... The prophets think it's a disaster. It's a disaster if people are unfaithful. It should be that way for everybody who claims to be a Christian. It's, you should walk around with the attitude of, we are in a disaster. If it doesn't bother you that the church is unfaithful, and you can walk out of here and just live your life, and it doesn't bother you, then you got problems. We're, you're not going to have a suddenly. It should bother you the things that bother God should bother you. And the things that don't bother God shouldn't bother you. What's God bothered by? Unfaithfulness? Indifference? Lackadaisical attitude? Apathy? Those are the things that bother God. And if you're able to live your day, and, and, and if you're able to live your week, and you never think about the church as a whole, I'm not talking about just our church, you never think of the church as a whole, you don't understand what's going on, you don't know the sign of the times, we're going to have a tough time getting a suddenly here. Because we should become more, it should be, it should be eating at you more and more. Until finally, and see, this is what most people do, is when it eats on them, is they go out and they leave the room before the mighty rushing wind. Because that's what it's, because the devil uses that to try to drive you to go do something before God can create a suddenly. And that's why we don't have suddenlies in the church. That's why we haven't had one. Is because most people go out and start doing something instead of waiting for God to suddenly show up. And again, I'm not advocating being lazy in sitting around being suddenly, waiting for a suddenly. I'm talking about this feeling that, you, that we carry about inside of us should eat at us more and more. Until finally a suddenly shows up. And you see, that's the problem with the religious crowd. There's nothing eating them, except how, how quick we can get out of church. That's what's eating them, is what we get out at noon. So I don't expect in most churches to be a suddenly. And it's going to be even difficult in most word churches to get a suddenly, because they won't wait long enough. They feel as though we have to go out and save the world. And I got news for you. They've already, most of the world has already heard our, the message that we have right now. And I'm all for an urgency to rescue people. But I'm way more urgent to become in the image of Christ. Because that's the witness that the world is waiting for. That's the suddenly that I'm waiting for. Is for Jesus to show up here in his temple. And something's going to happen that's going to change us. And now, again, I'm not sitting, I've got to say this, I'm not saying just to sit around and wait for a suddenly. 
I'm saying there should be more and more of a desperation. We should be able to, to see a desperation more and more in our prayers here than what we had at the beginning. Sometimes I hear it in people's voices as they struggle to find words. And I see, I like that because, because when I'm listening to people struggle for words, I'm listening to them, uh, I'm, 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 I'm putting this into play that one of these days, they're going to get us suddenly. And there should be more and more of a desperation as we pray. And when I say desperation, I'm not talking about saying words of desperation. I'm talking about a heartfelt desperation. We can, we can say, oh God, we're desperate for you, and make those words, but is it inside of your heart? Are you carrying this around with you, like as I described, are you carrying around this dissatisfaction? I'm not talking about, yeah, I'm carrying around dissatisfaction. I got hurt when I was young. and That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about carrying around your hurts or your wounds or your fears or your anxiety. I'm talking about carrying about a dissatisfaction that we're not the people that we should be. If the Pharisees, if the religious crowd of Jesus' day had had that satisfaction, they would have had a remarkable change when Jesus came to his temple. But they, weren't, they were not, they didn't have a dissatisfaction inside of them. They loved the money, they loved the prestige, they loved to be called rabbi, rabbi. They were satisfied with where they were at. And they thought they were more right than God. And I'm saying this today. I know we've got some ladies here, but I'm really speaking to the men. Because I see a lot of the women have this desperation, but I don't see a lot of the men that have it. I see a lot of the women that are struggling and they're hungry and they're thirsting. And, they, and a lot of times when they stand up here and they speak, they can't. I, I watch them try to put into words what it is they're trying to say. And you can, listen, you can discern and feel the desperation of their heart. Sorry, ladies, you had to be here. It'd be nice if it was an all man crowd. But I need some men to get desperate. God needs some men to get desperate. To be changed into his image. To lay aside all the stuff that so easily ensnares us and holds us back. And to start getting desperate. To be changed into his image. To not be satisfied with where you're at. I mean, it can go for the ladies, too. I'm not, I'm not you know, dis-including them. I'm just saying that I see, a lot of times, I see the women taking the forefront in prayer, in music, and a lot of times in teaching, and the men are kind of just kind of being handheld, held, you know, come along, guys. And I want to see some guys start taking some Some forcefulness there. And when I say forcefulness, I'm not talking about getting loud when you pray. All I'm saying is, is I want you to start saying just to, to God, God, make me desperate. I want to know, God, what bothers you. And I want it to bother me. And if we're not willing to do that, we'll probably, some people will get a suddenly here, but some won't. And when this suddenly comes, it's going to be such a radical altercation, or, uh, uh, alteration in people's lives that th those of you that don't get the suddenly may not want to be around it too much. And it may cause some real problems in relationships. You know what I mean by that? You know, right now we leave church and we kind of kind of go back to life as normal, don't we? We go out and we eat and 
start talking about worldly things. What if it suddenly happens here, and all that, goes, and, and, and for most of us, or part of us, all of that goes out the window. But you're still left with wanting to walk out of here and lead a regular, kind of a normal life. That's going to cause quite a division and conflict, isn't it? So I'm wanting everybody to do this, but I want some of the guys or the guys to start getting desperate and start stepping out and being uncomfortable. Do you know what I mean by that? You know, Kathy asks here every day, how long have we been praying together? Huh? Five years? Five years, six years? <clears throat> And I know there's a couple of guys that do, but a lot of times she asks, who wants to pray for this or who wants to pray for that? And most of the time it's the women that say, I will, I will, I will. Let's start stepping out and, being, and doing something uncomfortable once in a while. Well, it's time to move forward. I mean, I hate to be so blunt and, and so pointed, but um, I'm, uh, it's... Uh, it's, it's, we want a suddenly here. And I think it's going to take everybody to get a suddenly. I mean, I don't think there were people in the upper room. I don't think there was, I don't think all the women were desperate and all the guys were just kind of being, kind of being pulled along. In fact, when they come out, who's doing the speaking? The guys. And they're not being bullies. They're not being, you know, Hitler, you will do what I say. They're coming out with a heart change. And they're coming out, when I say with a heart change, in other words, everything they're doing is trying to draw people to Jesus. Not just to be the boss. Or like you said, the head of the house. I'm the head of the house. You will do what I say. No. It's... You're only the head of the house if you are the tail of Jesus. Let me put it that way. Then you're the head of the house. If you're not the tail of Jesus, if you're not underneath him, fully submitted unto him, then you ain't the head of the house. You may, you may have that title, but you don't have the function. You see what I mean? Yeah, or the anointing. And that's what it takes, is the anointing. And anointing comes to desperate people. Anointing comes to people who are hungering and thirsting to be righteous, to be like Jesus. And so we've preached that, we've preached victory over death, we've preached victory over sin, and yet we don't seem to get it, do we? But I think we will if we ever get it suddenly. And so what is the purpose of the church service? Is that every time we come here and every time we exalt him in music and call him high and lifted up and we recognize how low we are, it starts making us more and more desperate. And it opens the door. When desperation finally reaches maturity, now that's the problem. We won't let it mature. We run out and we go do something to try to alleviate that feeling. When desperation matures, you get a suddenly. And that's what, that's what I'm looking for. And that doesn't mean that I don't love every service where God moves and pe things change. I mean, you know, we're not going to sit around and be the same people every service. And then a suddenly is going to come. There has to be some change taking place, and I like the change that takes place up to the suddenly. But I don't want us to sit around and think we're okay, and we're more right than God is, and eliminate our suddenly. Yep. That, well, I went to church, I sang the songs, I agreed with the message, I've kind of cleaned my life up a little bit, I'm okay. You know, the more we do that, the more less okay you should feel. Did you know that? <clears throat> do you know that? 
Do you realize the closer you get to God and the more and the more you get cleaned up and the more you realize what this Bible says, the more undone you realize you are and the more desperate it should make you become. And so if you've got the feeling that, well, I'm okay, I'm pretty good, it's nothing, you know, I'm in, then we've eliminated our suddenly. Amen? Any questions? I just wanted to talk about suddenlies this morning because, and I kind of wanted a message to the guys. And I want just the guys to get desperate. Not to start screaming prayers or try to act like or say desperate words. Do you know what I mean? Mouth service, lip service. Draw near him with your mouth and honor him with your lips, but your heart is far from him. I just want you to get desperate to be changed and to be bothered by what bothers God. Do you know what bothers? Do you know what really bo you know what bothers God? Is when His people don't change. <laughs> Did you know that? That really bothers God. There are certain things that bother God, and this is you know uh, it was the illustration was used. Uh, it's the difference between King Saul and King David. You know, King Saul, all he did was keep some sheep to be sacrificed. David sent somebody into battle to get killed, took, you know, slept with his wife, got her pregnant, then sent her husband to get killed. Tried to, tried to figure a way to get his husband to sleep with her so he could cover it up. When, he wouldn't, when the husband wouldn't do it, he sent him into battle to be killed, then took, him, took his wife as his wife. Took Uriah's wife as David's wife. Now, which one would you think God would be more bothered by? You'd think David, you'd think, he, that you'd think God would just annihilate David. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because we're so humanistic. We think that because David did something to a human being, oh, that was just terrible. After all, all Saul did was did something to God. No big deal. See, Saul did something to God. David did something to a human being. And we're so humanistic and we're so human, uh, earthly oriented that when we read stories like that, we think, David, well, that's just terrible. Because look what David did to Uriah. That's just terrible. I mean, after all, all Saul did was kick dirt in God's face. That's no big deal. It's no big deal to disobey God. It's not near as big a deal as killing a human being. See, it bothers God when we're disobedient. I remember one time I preached about David. And I said... Uh, while the child, while his child was sick, he was fasting, he was in sackcloth and ashes, and he wouldn't eat, and he wouldn't wash, and he wouldn't do anything. And then when the child died, he got up, washed himself, and went and ate. And, yeah, and praised. And all the people said, we don't understand you. What is the matter with you? The child's alive, and then you're doing all your groveling. Now it's dead, and now you're happy. What is wrong with you? It's because you don't understand God. Or somebody who has the kingdom of God. Because once the child died, he recognized, hey, I'm going to go to that child. That child's not coming to me. It's over. Amen? So we need to be bothered by what God's... You need to find out what God is bothered by. You can read your Bible and find out what bothers God. And it's not what religion says bothers God. Yes, Paul? I'm not absolutely sure how to say this. But for me, it's the thing that as a guy, as a man, we have always given away what God rightfully gave to us. And that is, he put us in a place 
where we to, were to share with our mate the house, the place, but he meant for us to be the leader of the faith in our family. Mm -hmm. He means for us guys to be the same here, the leaders of the faith within this group, mm -hmm. within our family. It's like the other day when we were reading Proverbs and I said, who are our children? All of these are our children. All of us are our children. There's no separation. And I'm in total agreement with you that we, we need to speak. And for me, it's... For me, it's partially the idea that on a human aspect, in some cases, I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but I really don't care if I am. I just want to know the truth. And so when I speak it, that's what I'm really seeking for, is the truth. I want to hear the truth. Mm -hmm. And whether that puts me down on the floor or not, I don't care. Yeah, he called the men to lead. But he called the men to submit first. Called the men to submit first. And we have to define what is leadership. Tell me, what is leadership? When he called us to lead the faith, what does that mean? See, leadership... See, I don't know how to describe this. <clears throat> well, Jesus kind of described it. He said, those who want to be great in the kingdom should be the least. And he said, you know how the Gentiles love to lord it over them that they have the rule over. He says, it shall not be so among you. So it has nothing to do with being louder than women. It has nothing to do with praying longer than women, teaching longer than women, using a, 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 you know, a yelling voice over a woman. It has to do with a submission to God. And so when the men start submitting to God, that's really what leadership in the kingdom is. Remember, remember what I taught last week about um, we have a, we, we're in a kingdom that's not of this world? That means you look at every leadership quality that's in the kingdoms of this world, and that's not of God. That's not of God. God's leadership is a completely different type of leadership. It's a leadership that looks like it's a submission. That's what it is. If the leadership in the kingdoms of this world, you look like a leader, you act like one, you tell people what to do, then you have to know that in the kingdom of God, it's just the opposite. It's somebody who is submitted to God that sees that submission and recognizes, I want to follow that submission. It's not, I want to follow that guy that's bossing me around. I want to follow that submission. So when I see the guy start submitting to the kingdom of God and start submitting to the anointing and submitting to what God likes, then, they will, then they'll, have, they'll start to move into a leadership position. But as long as they don't have a desperation to want to submit unto God and say, and be desperate for change and desperate for truth. See, I always care whether I'm in right or not. Because if I'm wrong, I'm taking people down the wrong path. So I'm not going to speak a thing. And that's, that's what really throws me and Kathy a lot of times is because we don't know if we're right or wrong, we won't do anything. For fear that we'll wreck somebody's life. Because all you have to do is speak one word or do one thing and you can wreck a lot of people's lives. 
And we've all done it, but you have to be very, very careful because if you say the wrong thing, if you do the wrong thing, that's going to stick in people's minds for the rest of their lives. You know what I mean? Especially if it's something that you claim to do for God. And so when I get these teachings, you know, I stand up here in, in fear and trembling, thinking, God, I mean, you, you just don't know. You just don't know. The, the war that goes on inside of my head all week long. That's why I say I'd like to be able to take that out and set it on a shelf somewhere and go on vacation for a while. The problem is, is if we could do that, we'd do it all the time and we'd never get desperate and we'd never get a suddenly. So if you want to be a leader, then you have to be submitted to God. That'll be between you and God. See, leadership is never, is never defined by what people tell you whether you are or whether you aren't. Leadership is defined by your submission to God. And the more you submit to God, the more of a leader you are. Without a title. Without being told you're a leader, without being told anything, it's the more submitted you are to God, the more leader you are. Because people will recognize your submission and say, I want to follow that. Yeah, that's what Jesus did. They'll recognize your submission and they'll say, that's what I want to follow. So I always, you know, <clears throat> I always want to be right in God. You know what I mean? Not, not right in my own way, but right in God. And if I'm not, then I don't do anything. And a lot of times it can be a very uncomfortable situation or feeling with people you know, when you don't know what to do, but I'm not going to fake it. I'll just be quiet. And usually there's somebody else that knows something, and they'll, uh, they'll take over. That's what I like about this church, is a lot of times there's other people that'll take over, and they'll pray something, or they'll do something, or they'll say something, and takes the ball off my head. Sometimes I know what to do, but a lot of times I don't. But I'm desperate for a suddenly in this church. And I think the more desperate we become, the more in tune we become to a suddenly. Anybody else? Yeah. I think <coughs> one of the kind of what I'd call a rude awakening is that we get pretty uh, comfortable with new things and knowing that we're going to be changed. I mean, you know, we, some of us don't change nearly as fast as we think we should be, like you say, we're, but we're dissatisfied because we're not getting as much as we want, but we know that we're changing. But we can get pretty, pretty um, complacent in the fact that we're in a place where we know that's the move, that we're going to have to move, that there's no sitting still. And we see what's in the world around us, and we know that's wrong. And we just absolutely know that there, there's got to be a change in them. But I think the part that grieves me the most is we're not really, we talk about it, and you talk, and you preach about it even, what goes on in other churches. But we don't see what's going on. And uh, when you do, and you see how far away it is from, from what God's trying to do, it, that's what brings a terrible dissatisfaction to me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like you don't realize how how absolutely stopped they are because we've been going on for 25 years and we've been moving forward and they're still back there where we were 30 40 years ago and it's like that if that doesn't make you desperate nothing will it's like terrible to think that if somebody well it's like what pastor steve said last night you know we've got to be willing to be different. And unless we show that difference, those people don't have a prayer. They don't have anything mm -hmm. going for them unless they see a difference in someone else. 
because what they're seeing week in and week out is the same thing we saw all those years ago. And I'd rather be dead than, than go back to that perpetual death all the time. That's what brings us a dissatisfaction to me because I want, I want to see movement. <laughs> I want to see Holy Spirit moving. And I don't think they even know that there is any life out there. They just, they just see that's all there is. And, you know, they'll even admit that what's going on in the world is terrible. Mm -hmm. But they don't see that what's going on in them is because they think they're right. Well, let, uh, let, me, let me, you know, there's also some bad suddenlies in the Bible. Did you know that? Like there's one scripture that says, suddenly he shall be broken, and that without remedy. Yeah, suddenly destruction. Uh, yeah, in fact, that says that in the New Testament. When they say peace and safety, then suddenly destruction comes upon them. So there's some bad suddenlies too. And so uh, that's something we need to be aware of. But one of the things that, that you see I've noticed is, you, you, if you notice a lot of times when people are leading praise and worship or when they're praying, you notice that there's a lot of tears in some people but not in others. There's tears because they're becoming so desperate and so frustrated that it's starting to come out in emotions. And if we're able to just come here and make prayers after service or anything and yet not have any emotions, uh, 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 you know, have any emotional uh, outbursts come, I'm not saying every week, I'm just saying that once in a while, if you're really being touched by God in your prayer, man or woman, there should be some emotion attached to it. And when there's not, it shows me there's no desperation. You know, I see people struggling for words. You know, I see people uh, frustrated, trying to figure out, why, you know, it's almost like they're trying to, to, you know, how can we make this work? And yet some people are always cool, the guys, cool and got it all together. And I'm not saying fake emotion or fake tears or anything else. I'm just saying get desperate for God. And you'll start understanding what it is to be, when you pray, to be, to have, yeah, to have desperation, but also once in a while, God will touch you in your emotions. <clears throat> I mean, when they came in and they told me, I came in here this morning and they told me about Hunter and how he got prayed for, immediately tears welled up in my eyes. And he doesn't even go here. He doesn't even go here. And yet I got touched by what they said to me. My emotions got touched. <clears throat> Why? Because I know God loves that. Because God loves that. And I was thinking of how he thought and what he felt like to see somebody that young, a young man that's that handsome, that's in that situation right there. I mean, come on, man. If you're not touched by that, you, you got to, you, yeah, you're not desperate. You, you don't, you're not understanding where I'm coming from this morning if you're not touched by that. Or Kayla, or anybody, you know, or people that, that get touched in our church when they go down there. It should do something inside of you. There should be a leaping inside of you and a, and a welling up of tears. And if that isn't happening, you need to get desperate. You need to get desperate. <clears throat> The microphone, please. <laughs> you talk about Hunter. And there was a desperation there, apparently, too. Uh -huh. For him yeah. to take off from here, where he had yeah. other responsibilities, yeah. and could drive to Kansas City. Now, that's not just a little short no. skip and a hop. Yeah. He was desperate. Yeah. 
he got what he went after and then for him to when they said when they said what was it you're gonna run or something like that it's time for you to run and he started running in place like this yeah I know but I'm I'm 58 years old so <laughs> and I'm a little I'm a, and I'm a little overweight too so give me a break would you <laughs> that hurts <laughs> yeah and and see and so that's why it touched me because I know Hunter's pretty reserved you know and so for him to go down there and be obedient like that see that's that see that's leadership is you submit to you submit to something that looks foolish see what I mean and that's that's the marks the beginning of leadership is is a submission and so if you're not touched by that if people can tell you that and you think oh that's really nice or you're still thinking about your day or this or that then see you're not you, you don't know where I'm coming from with this you're not carrying that desperation inside of you and we need that to get a suddenly because we need a suddenly here we, I mean, we need to change from week to week glory to glory I'm not saying that but we need a suddenly and I'm waiting for a suddenly and I think God wants to bring one not just to our church but to the church is that it? Yeah. Huh? Oh. I thought he called my name. We should call it Mick. I didn't see the whole service last night, yeah. but what I did see was Hunter and Kayla. Yeah. I mean, I got up there just before that and... When Pastor Steve, Steve said, the guy in the white shirt, I didn't know if Hunter was even still there yeah. or not because I thought maybe he might have went home the night before after church. When he said something about the guy in the white shirt, I thought, man, that's going to be Hunter. And then he said, have you got somebody with you? Bring her too. And see, I couldn't see who he was talking about until they come up there. And it was Hunter... And, I mean, think about that. That is an awesome, awesome thing. That's, I've never had that happen at World Revival Church, but I've had it happen in other churches before. Yeah. And it's, it's a confirmation that what you're praying and, and what you're, God's hearing it, and God's doing something about it, you know? And I thought, man, how many times have I been to World Revival Church and I think Pastor Steve has prayed for me once in passing, you know. And then I thought, Hunter must be doing something that I'm not doing, you know. Hunter must be, and after hearing the, the story from them down there and, and the behind the scenes thing, Hunter was sitting back there praying specific things, and specific things were getting answered, mm -hmm. you know. So... I want to be desperate like that, you know? And I'm tired of just being desperate inside here and then going out there expecting that it's just going to happen. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not, you know? What's happening out there is the normal everyday routine and, and struggles in life. And what I'm wanting is what I can experience in here. Yeah. And something's going to have to change, and it's going to have to be me. Because the world is not going to change, right. and my job is not right. going to change. Mm -hmm. Well, my job may be changing, but the people in my job and the people that, that, uh, that I deal with are not going to change so I can have an experience with God. Yeah. I'm going to have to do, do what it takes. Well, like I said, just reading through the scriptures, I just think that God is a God of suddenlies. And I think that it's only to a desperate people that he's going to do that to. A people that will allow him to work in them and wait for him at the same time. With, with the key word being allow them to work in them. Because you can't just sit there and go to church every, every Sunday and wait and hope something drops on you and now everything's hunky-dory. There's always going to be a continual change 
but there should be an increase in the desperation of what we're to become. And when that reaches maturity, I think there'll be a suddenly. Amen? Father, we just once again, we thank you for your word this morning. and Lord, we just ask you to seal it up in our hearts. God, we know that you want a people, a peculiar people, a special treasure that is set aside for your use only. God, we see that in the Scriptures. We see what kind of people we're supposed to be, and we see what we are, and there's a great gulf between the two. And so, God, we want to be desperate. We want to be made to be made desperate. And so, God, you know, come into our lives. Make us to do your precepts and your commandments. Make us to hunger and thirst after you so that we don't fill ourselves up with other things so we're not hungry for you. And God, I just thank you, Lord, that you seal us up in our hearts, that we do not forget what it is that was spoken here, and that God, as we recognize that feeling that we carry inside of us, this gnawing, this nagging, this, this, uh, <clears throat> this, un, this dissatisfaction, that God, as Paul said, he wanted to be further clothed, as we carry about this dissatisfaction, as it becomes worse and worse, that God, we will remember and we will recognize that we are coming closer to us suddenly. But God, make that feeling, make that desperation grow inside of us. Cause that dissatisfaction to grow inside of us. Because your word says that the satisfied soul loathes the honeycomb. But to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. And so God, we need a suddenly here in this church. And so God, we just thank you that we will continue to cry out. We will continue to stick with you. Continue to carry about this dissatisfaction and allow it to continue to grow and to mature. God, until finally we cry out or we reach a place to where suddenly you can come to your temple. And Father, we just thank you, God. We just thank you, Lord. Amen.